it is because of the pandemic and things have slowed down, things are getting caught up. Every industry is really feeling it right now. That's probably the most difficult thing that we're trying to overcome. There are just so many different technologies now in the food industry and all the industries, obviously, that allow your connections and your availability to knowledge because like there's so many people on these platforms that I wouldn't be able to connect with before um, that will make my company better. I can understand what customers all over the world are looking for through these platforms. Hi there, food enthusiasts. Thanks for tuning in to Future Foodcast, where thought leaders in today's food industry discuss the trends and technologies that will help shape the future of food. Today, I'm speaking with Mel Bank from uh, eatnoco.com. And eatnoco stands for eat with no compromise. Uh, So it's a new company. Um, Mel is the founder of the company uh, during the pandemic. And what she has done is created a company with a different focus around healthy ingredients with the theory that in a sense, food can work um, as medicine in the right case. We're all different, but there's things that are gonna be healthy for you uh, as well as taste good. And so the concept of no compromise is where that comes from. So if you go to the eatnoco.com website, you'll see the products out there that you can buy, but you'll also get the story of the company, the blog, and even the pop-up events they're having. Um, They're headquartered in Toronto right now, but they're looking at expanding into the U.S. market as well. So with that, um, I want to welcome Mel to the podcast and uh, have her give us a little bit more background on where uh, the company, in a sense, came from, uh, which has only been open a little over two years now. So Mel, take it away. Thank you. So I was selling in Cocoa Market, and then the owner had um, suggested, which I had noticed too, that there was a big gap in the market for really good comfort food like pasta or burgers or things like that, that were um, nutrient dense, um, really good for you, made you feel good, but also tasted really good um, and didn't have fillers or anything. Those things you can pronounce on the label. Uh, that was a big gap that we saw um, in, our dis- in our early discussions. So what came of that is testing recipes, a very rigorous testing of recipes, to not only make food that tasted really good, but also made you feel good after eating it. Um, And that's where the name NOCO came about. Uh, It stands for no compromise. So we're not compromising on ingredients. You're not compromising on how you feel. Um, It's just good food that's good for you, nutrient dense um, and comforting. Excellent. Yeah, that's, uh, it's different than uh, a lot of the places my son used to go to when he was a kid. The funny thing is you're right. What's interesting, and. You're more advanced, certainly, than I am, and most people, I think. Uh, a lot of us consume food, but we don't understand food at the level you have. So you've had what I call a long food journey. My son actually followed something similar. He was a kid that always wanted to go to McDonald's, and he's evolved into a gourmet chef where he's taught himself all these different cuisines, and, and he understands ingredients at a level I'll never understand either. But like you, he invests an awful lot of time in, I'll call it, understanding the ingredients, preparation, sort of going through designing, if you will, his own dishes and so on that come up. And it, it really is a talent and, a, and an effort, if you will, that I don't think too many people make. Most of us just want to consume the stuff. So if we find something that's healthy, like you're producing, uh, and it tastes good, um, we're probably all in. So that's a great deal. So that's a little bit about where your product came from. And um, so first of all, today, I can get that directly, I think, from your website. Is that correct? Yes, you can get it directly from the website. We also sell in some stores through Toronto, um, expanding through the GTA and also into the state soon. Excellent. All right. So you're right. You're, you're, as you said, you're arriving in California first. Yeah, exactly. We're going to start in LA. Um, we're starting in one of the bigger health food stores there. We're really excited, hopefully in the next couple months. Um, and then we're just going to focus on growing outwards from there. It's uh, LA has a really amazing culture around um, feeling good, health food, eating food that makes you feel good. Um, so it's a really great place for NOCO to be. I think that's where the, the industry sort of the strongest or one of the stronger places that it's really doing well there. Yeah. So you start, you've been working in Toronto. So how long have you been open in Toronto? So we're fairly new. Um, I've been, well, I've been selling the products, um, under NOCO for about a year and four months now. Um, but we, I was only selling them online, uh, really, and just through Cocoa Market, the one store. I didn't really know where we were going to take it, but 
Now, um, fast forward, yeah, about a year and four months, uh, it took about six months to get into other stores or deciding to go into other stores. So yeah, about maybe about eight or nine months, we've been um, actively seeking out being in stores throughout uh, just Toronto. And then the past month or so, we're thinking about uh, broadening our horizons. <laughs> Right, right. So in, in Toronto, of course, it's, a, I don't know, it's over a million people, I believe, in the greater Toronto area, right? So it's not a small city. So within Toronto, there, of course, there's lots of other options uh, for food, whether you want to buy it or prepare it yourself. Um, the question is, how do, you, how do you target who's the right customer in your marketplace? What's, who's the, tell me who the best customer would be, best prospect. Yeah, I think, I think we, we sort of had an idea. Um, that it was going to be sort of health conscious, um, 30 to 50, um, the people who go grocery shopping for their households. Um, yeah. I had an idea. I also, as I said, I used to work in advertising. So I kind of knew how to build a bit of a target market before heading into the market. Um, and what was nice is when I was initially just selling in that one specialty grocery store, um, I got to sort of see who was buying a lot of the products you kept coming back um, and we sort of, uh, we guessed right. <laughs> I mean, it definitely okay. was um, that middle, like that age group between 28 to, to 55, um, predominantly women were buying it. Um, and I think that's just because uh, women are predominantly the grocery shoppers of the household um, from studies that I read. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's changed over the years, but I've definitely seen that specifically with the NOCO products. It could also be that maybe the design is um, more appealing to women. I'm not sure, but um, so far that's who's been buying our products mostly. Um, and it's, yeah, it's interesting to see that. And I think um, something that will be more interesting is as that was only one store, those, that's the data that I collected. I think every store, the clientele is going to be different. I'm going to learn a lot, um, which is where I think technology and data as I grow and as I implement more of it is going to come in handy because I'll be able to see um, who's really buying the products, when they're buying it, where they're buying it. And that's going to make my target market really focused in. And that I'm excited for that. Yeah. And, you know, it's great that you're actually you coming, forget NOCO for a second. You did mm -hmm. have a background before that. And I think that both of those things, your experiences, first of all, as a teacher, means that you understand the concept of trying to take a population that doesn't know something and educate them on that and keep them happy, engaged at the same time. My background also was I spent three years as a kindergarten teacher. And wow. so if you can, if you can uh, in a sense, get 25-year-olds to focus for eight hours a day, that's a rare skill. And so teaching actually is very valuable, I think, for what you're trying to do in communicating a lot of these ideas. The other thing that's great is you did have a marketing background in advertising. So you understand the whole process in a sense, reaching, identifying audiences, reaching them, measuring them, and so on. And that's also very helpful to a business like yours to start out. Um, and then, so the, you have the advertising side, you did a great job on the website, I can see that. It's, okay. it's not just that I can get your products there and find out about the company. The bigger thing is I get lots of ideas. There's a big blog there, uh, lots of uh, not only ideas about what to cook and, and meals to prepare, but even in a sense, how I can help improve my health out there too on the blog. So that's pretty good stuff. Um, I think, so I'll say the website is there. Um, what other means, because uh, you have an advertising background, any mm -hmm. other thoughts on how to advertise at all? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely first things first, like always social media is huge. Um, that's where people usually go to first when they're trying to find out about your company. They want to look at pictures. They want to see if anyone's tagged you, if they've been eating it. Um, that's huge. That's just sort of like a starting point, I would say. And then leveraging leveraging that in different ways. Like there's lots of influencers out there who have your target audience um, as their audience. So reaching out to them, collaborating with them, um, having them try your products, honest reviews, um, not yeah. telling them what to say about the product, just sending them product to try um, and seeing what they genuinely genuinely think about it and, and speaking about it um, organically to their their audience um, allows people to get exposed to your product, um, see if they want to try it and then go buy it. Um, so that's one way you can also do paid advertising on those platforms, um, just repetition in general. People, uh, there's actually um, a study that I read years ago when I was working on advertising that it actually takes about 
um, seven times or someone to see an ad or to see something for them to actually make the purchase. Um, you need that repetition in your brain to want to make that move. It's actually really hard for people to pull the trigger sometimes and make purchases. So being on multiple platforms, putting the ad in front of them, talking to influencers, throwing on events, which I've, I've done often too, pop-ups, getting people to come in and try. Uh, the product is huge. Um, something I'm actually doing in January for, um, it's a mix of like advertising and also just general knowledge sharing is that I'm mm -hmm. putting on a panel in late January. Um, I've invited a director of supply chain from a, a big company in functional chocolate, um, and another owner of a health food company. They make um, beautiful gluten-free cookies, those kind of things. So they're coming in um, and talking about transparency and talking about um, all these sort of important things about running a business. Um, but I'm also showing people that like, as NOCO, we care and we want to learn more about these things. We're bringing these people in to learn more. And then it's exposing our company to the world almost in a marketing way to just sh yeah. show them who they are, right? Like, I think that's important. I, I, am an, I like to be honest. I like to be real with what we're doing. And I think the best way for people to get to know NOCO is to get to know me because I'm NOCO. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, you make a great point. So that's actually one of the key reasons Future Foodcast exists was uh, we were working with a marketing company and uh, as a software company, we said, hey, you know, we're having a hard time researching the food supply chain well. And so we said, okay, this has been difficult to get. Maybe the right idea is go out and invite, in a sense, companies who are in the food supply chain, who have new ideas and are creative, to come in and talk to us. And then just in a sense, as you say, share the information. So obviously yeah. our stuff is going out on the YouTube channel. It goes out on Spotify when these things are published and so on. But um, anything you're doing really sounds smart. And I think what's neat about what you said is you're bringing in other companies that complement you in effect. So as you say, when you can hold an event, like an in-person event, they can sample your stuff. They can sample the other guys or other companies' food as well, which is a creative mm -hmm. thought. Um, the pop-ups you're doing are about physical events. Have you given any thought um, to how you can do that? Is there any way to do that virtually at all? Where in a sense you hold an event, not different than this, it's an organized mm -hmm. event on your end. You're showing me what you wanna show me, but then give me, as you said, some incentives to either come back again for another recipe or another whatever. And at the same time, give me whatever a coupon to try something out free. Cause I know on the virtual side, it's mm -hmm. not like physical. Physical, you can have samples there and say, hey, walk away. Let me know if you liked it directly. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I actually, I haven't really thought about it doing like a virtual event like that. Um, especially now because things are opening up a bit and we can be in person and I'm craving that personal <laughs> interaction. Yeah. But at the same time, like virtual is still a huge thing and technology is a huge thing and everyone's using it a ton. Um, no one's going to the office really anymore. I mean, everyone's working from home. People are used to having these virtual interactions. So it is yeah. a new door that's being opened that, I mean, is sort of something I should be thinking about more. I mean, even as you were saying that, it could be interesting to, who knows, like send samples to a group of friends and they all try it together on a group hangout on Zoom. And then I'm there yeah. for questions and feedback. Who knows? You know, there's so many opportunities that really could arise right. So I'll volunteer to be one of the people in your uh, Zoom <laughs> yeah. in, in your gallery. And you'll say, who's that guy that keeps eating that mushroom burger? Oh, that's Jim. He always eats those. He doesn't stop. So yeah, right. I could be part of your audience for that. But I think, yeah, the thing is you have a very different product. You have a set of uh, principles around how you create the product and the value proposition for it. And so it is very different. And I also agree with your point that you have to hit people multiple times with the, the same message before you get what I call a significant uptake on the action end. You know what I mean? So yes. like everybody else on the planet, when you're virtually working from home or virtually connected, you probably are doing five different things at once and you're not paying a lot of attention. So I see that mushroom mm -hmm. burger and flip by, I go, oh yeah, sure, fine, boom. And I go back to checking email or working on a project or whatever I do. But you're right, with repetition, um, especially if you, if you wind up having to travel to the same place, whether it be your website or I see it on YouTube or popping up, as you said, on Instagram, wherever it is, if I see that same thing over and over, there's a point where I'm gonna break down and say, you know what, I should click in and look at the blog or see a little bit more, ask myself, how could I ever try this out? So I, that's a smart move um, from a marketing perspective to do that. Uh, we actually used to do the same thing. My, my dad actually had a, a, 
merchandising company where he built uh, displays for stores. So kind of like when you go into a new store and you say, oh, gee, is there a little thing that tells me about this? And usually you see those stores that those are the things that are there with the, somebody cooking up samples or whatever and offering them something like right, that. Right. But to, to get that reach out there is a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we're really focused right now on, I'll call it the first, the Toronto area, and then it'll be LA next, if you will, uh, for the distribution yeah. side of it. How is how do you in a sense produce um, the products at this point? I know looking at the website, I can see you have a variety of different products out there. They're packaged mm -hmm. in in a sense bags, and I believe everything, if I've got it right, is frozen. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So tell me a little bit more about the production side of it. Yeah, sure. Um, so it actually started originally. I mean, I was making everything by hand myself for the first four or five months. I was working till like two in the morning, producing all this uh, product and then freezing it and selling it and bagging it myself. Um, but since we did grow so quickly and um, I was very lucky to be working in a production kitchen that the owners um, have helped me and partnered with me. So they actually now are my production kitchen. Um, I have a uh, about two or three staff, give or take on whatever the, the week is and the, the amount of production needed. Um, right. who are making all the products for me. Um, and I'm still there almost every day, just making sure that the quality is there. Um, we're, I'm still very much involved in the process and just not um, physically rolling out the doughs anymore like I was before. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really nice because now I can up production, um, especially as I'm growing a lot, having more than one hand to do that, especially because everything is handmade right now with the goal eventually, obviously, to get machinery to bring costs down. But right now, I mean, it's, we love it. We're, we're in there, we're, we're making everything by hand. A lot of love's going into it and it's, good. it's it's been really good. That's really great. So it's an interesting story because in a sense, how it's produced is different than the way I'll say Kraft produces cheese as an example, mm -hmm. slightly, uh, or you know how <laughs> they production plants make ketchup and all those things. They're on an industrial scale, and yours isn't. So it is mm -hmm. not only is it a, I'll call it a custom, uh, I'll call it a unique product, but it's also produced in a custom way. And that one of the things mm -hmm. that's interesting is a lot of uh, products that what I call specialty products like that. There's a story behind them, and so your website does a great job of you know in a sense telling me what the story is, but then also connecting to the product directly. I, I really I'll ask a dumb question because I'm working on it technically right now. No, I have know. a I'm doing a carbon management site. And one of the things we're going to be doing you, it sounds really crazy, is selling you a carbon offset, right? So you go, oh, I got a carbon offset. What the heck is that? Well, yeah. you made some carbon last year, now you offset it. Congratulations. But the bigger thing is, uh, the theory is that when you would buy one of these things, you get a certificate, right? And the certificate would have a QR code on it. And it, what it is, is you could say, hey, I bought these five carbon offsets uh, you know, from this company, and here's the deal. Um, I can show you they're authentic or they're sourced. You can see where these carbon offsets came from. So rather than saying, oh yeah, they're just carbon offsets and I bought them from this company. Uh, in a sense, these offsets that are being sold will be from uh, call it certified, uh, in a sense, ethical sources um, for carbon offsets. So it might be Jim's tree farm, Wendy's solar farm, you know, whatever, a sky's wind farm. And so you would actually have, because all those things are actually, there's a process to certify those. So when you buy something like that, you say, oh, it's, it's important that I can show the origin and the, uh, the veracity behind uh, the product they bought. And so in our world, we have to not only create a PDF certificate, but we have to put a QR code on there. And that means that you could just scan the QR code and say, oh, look, there's the five offsets I got from Jim's Tree Farm. And here's all about Jim's Tree Farm, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Because you have a story like that with the products you're producing and the way they're getting produced. Have you given any thought to maybe, uh, you know, trying to incorporate what I call the, the sourcing story behind the product? As an example, like right now, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to guess that the back of the package has a barcode that could be scanned at a, a specialty store, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the thought of trying to link it to, I'll quote a QR code that would tie it right back to, you know, I'll quote the, the production story and everything else. And it, it, it would also mm -hmm. actually could link you right to the website as well, obviously. Yeah, I, th I think that's so interesting. And I, I like the idea of, I mean, I think it goes with the technology that we're moving forward with or having full transparency of the supply chain and where the ingredients come from and how is everything made. Um, having, I mean, I think that the 
ultimate goal would to be some to have something like that where someone could basically scan the product and see exactly what they're getting into. Um, definitely something that we're thinking about for our future of our company and yeah. things that we need to continue to implement. Um, for now, we're definitely very aware of it, and we are we have very close relationships with um, the suppliers that we get our product from and we have conversations with them all the time about like making sure that we're not getting GMO because we are non-GMO um, right. making sure that it's fresh making sure that it's local like making sure that all those things are in place so that in the future when we do implement all of those um, I guess lines of transparency with our customers um, we're able to showcase that because that is so important to me it's important to my company um, that we are being honest throughout the process and that we are doing everything right. So having the ability to share that with everyone is basically the dream. Like that's, I want people to know how important that is to me, to my, to my company and being able to share that is, is lovely. Yeah, it would be great. So what's really kind of cool. I don't know. I'll, I'll make this up. Say there's 1.4 million people in the Toronto area and not, all 1.4 million people are literally your prospects. You have a set of best prospects, I'll say. And mm -hmm. ideally what you wanna do is build a strong relationship with that group. And the, to your point, the other side of it is you, and I will ask you to tell me more about this, but you also have suppliers that you prefer too, that you mm -hmm. say, hey, this is a great supplier for this or somebody else, and you build up those relationships. So you now have a network of both customers, your company and suppliers you work with, and say, you know, let's pull that network together on both ends. So that means mm -hmm. like you have a blog, it's, you know, can I get feedback on the blog? Can I type a thing? I've got a great recipe, a better recipe, in my opinion, for mushroom burgers, add that to the blog, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's customer feedback. The other side of it, of course, is the supplier side where you're going to say, I've got really good suppliers back to your point about transparency. And I want to share that with everybody else as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that brings up the whole supplier side of it. I Tell me a little bit about how you pick your suppliers uh, for what you're doing. And then secondly, um, talk to me a little bit about the pandemic impact that ha that has had on your supply chain. Yeah, I mean, we, we are very small and we've, we have through making relationships with these local suppliers have found preferred ones that we like working with, A, because they have been able to be transparent with us. Like if I call them and have a question about like, where's your cauliflower coming from? Um, is it local? And then the, especially with cauliflower, the prices fluctuate so much for a reason because eventually we can't grow it in Toronto anymore. So you have right. to grow it elsewhere. So, I mean, having that open conversation with the suppliers, knowing that they're gonna tell us like, okay, this is where it's, it's in Toronto, we're growing in now so we can buy more now so that we know that we're getting the cauliflower that we want the quality that we want. Um, we've over the past year have built those relationships um, with a few select vendors that we feel that we trust. And then now that we work through this production kitchen, um, uh, they actually have now taken over that relationship, but we have that transparency with my production kitchen. So I'm very close to them in there every day. So it's still the same thing. I'm still getting the same information. It's just one more person relaying it to me, but I yeah. mean, they're, um, even for just like reaching out about where, where are the eggs coming from? Oh, they came from Burnaby yeah. Farms in Canada. Great. They're a trusted local provider. We know them. We know that they have good products. Um, I always want to make sure that the suppliers that we're using are able to be transparent with us um, so that I can be transparent later with my customers. So and, those and are what, Yeah, that's great. And what's really interesting when you do that and you say, hey, I'm going to give, it's not just transparency to my supplier. You're also giving them visibility. Because when you identify who they are, yeah. now your customers are going, oh, that's so-and-so egg farm. That's so-and-so, you know, uh, cheese or dairy or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a benefit to them as well. So it, it, I would assume that it would deepen that relationship quite a bit. And at the same time, the customers are going to say, gee, I understand the whole thing better now because I can see even where the, the um, uh, supplies come from, uh, the food that's going into the products that you're building, which is really great. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's great. So tell me a little bit, one thing we haven't talked about, um, how has the pandemic affected you and, and uh, your kitchen where you're producing it, uh, if it's had an impact on your distribution? 
Yeah, I, I think the main thing that comes to mind when we talk about the supply chain in the pandemic, and this isn't even something just personal to me, I've heard this from so many other business owners or just workers, um, that shipping in general and getting things around, getting things to you or getting things elsewhere is so expensive, almost impossible, parts are missing, um, supply is low for so many things. Um, in general, prices are a lot higher for things. The main thing that sticks out to me is uh, as we're expanding into the US, um, getting the product there is way more expensive than it's ever been. Um, the shipping costs are so high, there might not even be space on the vessels for us to put the product there. Um, and that's, it is because of the pandemic and things have slowed down, things are getting caught up. Um, there is apparently a car short shortage because they're missing chips because they can't be shipped. Like every industry is really feeling it right now. Um, it's, that's probably well, the most difficult thing that we're trying to overcome for, an, for we'll now. <laughs> It's interesting because if you in your good thought because if you look at the U.S. market, um, it's very interesting. Um, I'll say because I went to school in upstate New York at Cornell, and I know that area, and they're mm -hmm. quote, just across the lake from yeah. Toronto. And I would think getting stuff there, I don't need container ships; I just need trucks. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. if I was trying to think of how to distribute, I might think of you know getting a truck going across the border might be simpler and a lot less expensive than trying to do a container ship or an airline flight, something like that. Both of those would be pretty insane, I think, from a, a logistics perspective, oh, yeah. where the truck, much like your Toronto delivery area, is uh, under a lot easier for you to control, yes. um, which would be nice as an opportunity. So you have Buffalo, you have upstate New York, Rochester, those areas that are probably not, I don't know, I'll say two, three hour drive kind of thing from your facility, which wouldn't mm -hmm. be too bad as a thought. Um, yeah, that's true. And, and actually just, <laughs> Uh, I went to Cornell. They have actually have a, a food science department there. You could easily find somebody actually there to mm -hmm. be a second producer for what you do that would be local as well. Oh, that's you know, super you could interesting. Yeah. Well, that's something we thought about too. I mean, because shipping such an issue through the pandemic, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years, things might not even shift. So talking about opening up second facilities, having um, maybe co-packers in other places seems right. like really the only possible solution um, because shipping and, is so expensive. Well, and, uh, having lived in that area and knowing what I call that environment, I can say you're going to find that there's well-qualified well um, co-packers uh, capacity up there, number one. And number two, uh, I worked in food service in that area, and I know for a fact there would be a high demand for the kind of product you're offering. Um, I can find other places and say, no, there's not a lot of demand. But in that particular area, I can promise you there'd be high demand. So it's the kind of thing where you could easily test it and sample it and say, oh, yeah, look, we put some samples out in a few stores and we got some good response. And that represents an opportunity at least to investigate for sure. So yeah, tell me a little bit. Very interested. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about sustainability. Um, a little bit more. Uh, we talked about supply chain challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. From your perspective, what are the challenges? as a manufacturer and a distributor, you see around sustainability issues uh, for, I'll call it efficiency, uh, reduction in waste, uh, you know, smaller carbon mm -hmm. footprint, um, you know, things like that. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's something that we think about. We are definitely moving towards um, trying to be as sustainable as possible. Um, the first thing off the bat is that our mushroom burgers are actually, one of our main ingredients is the pulp left over from a mushroom broth made in house um, for a different company. So we buy that off of them um, as it's pulled fresh. And then we use that to make our mushroom burgers as one of the main ingredients. Um, so it's that in itself is just reducing food weights by so much because that would have been thrown out. Um, I think yeah. Also, yeah. I was going to say that's a great story because they. Uh, I've heard other uh, uh, manufacturers talk about, they call it upcycling, yes, where they take the, I'll call it the waste and then they, in a sense, reuse it even to a, a more valuable product, which is really awesome. So it's not about just waste reduction. You're producing something of value from the waste, which is a win in several different ways uh, for sure. So that's, a, that's a big thing. Yeah. I remember near the beginning when I started working there and they were making this mushroom broth, they were always, they were always just like, this is so sad. Like, what are we going to do with this? And I'm like, I'll do something with it. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Give it to me. Yeah. So yeah. I was doing some testing and originally I actually wanted to do 
um, sort of like a savory bar of some sort. And then I made it and we all tried it. We're like, this is so good. And this is a burger. We're like this is definitely yeah. a burger. Um, so it wasn't even meant to be a burger, but um, just from seeing that there was something that can be used that was being discarded and being like, I need to do something with that, taking it, mixing in ingredients that I loved that were healthy, that made me feel good, nutrient dense, protein, whole foods. And then just sort of seeing what came out of that. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't like, I need to make a burger. What can I find? Where are the ingredients? It was almost like the reverse of like, I need to do something with this delicious upcycled mushroom pulp. Um, yeah. Let me make something delicious and let's see what we can do with that. Yeah, it's a great story. Uh, the other thing that's interesting too, all of your products are in a sense plant-based ultimately, I think. You don't sell cheeses or meats or anything like that, right? Yeah, so there, there's some that are plant-based. Um, a couple of them, or I say maybe half of them have eggs in them um, for like protein and flavor, but sure. they're vegetarian friendly. So there are no dairy, no meat. Um, right. Yeah. So that also has an impact from a sustainability perspective mm -hmm. in a sense that you have a different, I'll call it food cycle there uh, because you're really going more toward the plant side, uh, which yeah. does reduce, uh, has a lower carbon footprint overall for sure than say I'm a butcher shop. Where it's a little... Sure. Yeah. Uh, and so it's that's really a positive thing enough. as well. Um, yeah. And it's something yeah, I think about all the time. Oh, sorry. It's something I think about all the time um, too. I, I think I do want to eventually move over towards a more plant-based company. Um, I do, I'm, I'm not a vegan. I do though eat right. mostly vegan um, at home. I mean, I do go for dinner and I'll have meat. Um, I don't cook that much meat at home uh, for environmental reasons, for health reasons, for so many reasons. Um, so I think, and I think the way the world is sort of going right now, it's not really necessarily like uh, straight vegan, but I think it's like sort of what you're saying. It's right. being aware of the of the environmental damage that it's doing, being aware of maybe the mental or the physical health that it's that's maybe deteriorating inside. Like who knows? Like it's not necessarily that you need to cut everything out. It's just moderation, understanding what you're putting in your body, why you're doing it. Have a piece, have a steak if you're craving it, but it doesn't have to be an everyday occurrence kind of thing. And that's sort of also how I am with NOCO. Yeah, it's actually, I, I like that. Well, it goes back to your name, no compromise. So yeah. the bottom line is it's the other thing that I like about the thought that you're having is that it isn't, I'll call it a rules based thing saying, okay, we're all going to be all vegan, we're all going to be this, we're all going to be that. Mm -hmm. No, we're not going to line up together any more than we do, whether it's fashion or anything else. We don't vote the same, we don't. So we shouldn't have to eat the same, to your point. And I think the company really hits that theme is that we really should be, in a sense, trying to eat what works best for us, yeah. which means I have to like it. And maybe what I like, you don't like. It has to also be healthy for me. So what's healthy for me may not be healthy for you. Mm -hmm. That individual, um, I'll call it style message coming through, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is different. And I think the company does in a sense, reflect that when you go out and look at the blog and so on like that. And that's, mm -hmm. that definitely is a different kind of an experience, I think, for most of us. Um, I, I'll say I'm somebody that's been around too many decades and I just eat more like an animal. I just like, okay, if it's there and it's not walking as fast as he is, he'll consume it probably. But um, over the years, I've realized that I do need to be far more health conscious. And to your point, it has a huge impact when you start to think about your diet um, more consciously and focus on it and say, hey, you know, I'm not just gonna eat anything because it's there. I really need to say what works best for me. And so that whole approach um, is a pretty cool thing. And I think communicating that out to the audience is a really good deal as well. Um, anything else on stakeholders that uh, you, you operate in a community in Toronto now, you've got a business running, you have a production kitchen you're working with, you have suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, any, and the other thing I guess I'll loop back on a little bit, besides all the stuff you're doing through the website and communicating, is you did talk about the idea of these pop-up events and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm not in the Toronto area, but if I were, it would be easy, I assume, to, you know, see one of your events show up at some point. Yeah, so I, on my website, I have a section called events, and when they do come up, I put them on there. They're either ticketed or they're free, um, and we usually are serving food in one way or another, uh, and then usually providing some sort of um, uh, maybe education or some sort of mingling yeah. or something that 
uh, the customers and come together and have it have a conversation and and learn and talk and express sort of what they're interested in so that we can become a better company and we can help them find the kind of things that they need and what makes them feel good. Yeah, excellent. And then another thing I was going to, we talked about this before a little bit and mm -hmm. I'll loop in the conversation you had earlier about the thought that you're trying to connect, I'll call it uh, segments of, I'll call it potential customers, if you will, in mm -hmm. the community uh, to your, your company also to understand better the suppliers and all that. So I, I just bring up the general topic of technologies, but when you talk about trying to build trust, share information yeah. um, and uh, network in a sense of uh, communities, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, through a channel like the food chain, it's a natural technology for that, that I work with is blockchain. Yes. So in that we're guaranteeing the information hasn't changed. So in that sense, it's trusted. I could always put bad information into anything, mm -hmm. but the point of it is, if I have recorded information about where this came from, that recording is permanent. It's guaranteed that that data hasn't changed. Uh, you know, if you go through a blockchain for that. Mm -hmm. And we talked about before the idea of the QR codes looping it back. So I'm buying that mushroom burger and I can find out, or the package I should say of mushroom burgers, and I can uh, find out in a sense where it was sourced from, when it was made and the ingredients and so on. And that mm -hmm. kind of a thing um, is one technology, but there's other ones out there that may be able to help your business too. So any, any thoughts on technologies that might be important going forward? Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned blockchain. I think in general, just having better traceability in general, um, allowing you to see the processes of your company, how the production is maybe being bottlenecked and where efficiencies can come in. I think having technology that traces every step of the production up until the sale and even post sale, like having tracing the whole line will allow you to see like what's what's being slowed down, where can we make better efficiencies? And then it allows you to bring like a better product to the market because not only you're finding efficiencies, but you're you're being honest with what you're doing and you're making sure that you're getting the best option for what you want to have those efficiencies. Yeah. So one of the things that's interesting, because you're trying to build a community, honestly, I mean, that's the whole thing is you're trying to say, I'm here, I provide, I think, value. And I think for this segment of the community, uh, I can add value to them. I need to mm -hmm. communicate. I need to communicate. I need to build a long-term relationship mm -hmm. uh, and, and focus together. And in that concept, that the other thing that blockchain kicks in with a little bit is this concept of tokenization, they call it. So what right. that means is, uh, um, let's say Jim is a repeat visitor to your blog. Uh, I'm a repeat buyer. You can reward me with what I call tokens on your blockchain platform that says, oh, okay, so Jim shows up regularly. He signed up for my newsletter. He's in on the blogs. He's even contributed an article for all those things. You could give me mm -hmm. tokens and I can say, oh, cool. I can spend my tokens on the platform maybe by, you know, getting a 5% discount or something on a purchase I make or whatever it is, something like that. Mm -hmm. But the theory is, um, or I have referrals. In my case, I would just be passing it over to my son who knows more than I do and say, hey, Sky, come over to this website, check it out. And there's many different kinds of things that you would like to see as behavior from a supplier and from your uh, uh, prospects that mm -hmm. you'd say, hey, I think I can reward those on my platform. And that's the other kicker that um, that technology gives you, um, okay. which can really help build um, those kind of relationships for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. So um, and what else was I thinking tied off of that? There's the, also, um, yeah. speaking of technologies, um, I just remembered, I actually, so I signed up a couple days ago for um, a platform, it's called Range Me. So basically it's allowing you to, it's almost like a LinkedIn for your company and you can upload your products and upload um, your story, which you just talked about was so important when you want to sort of sell your product or get people to know you as a company, your story is so important. So you can upload your story in your bio, pictures, um, you can get verified, all these things. And it allows you to connect with the suppliers and the um, stores and all of those um, different sort of connected pieces. And it allows you to access those in, in a way that I had never been able to do before. So I think there are just so many different technologies now in the food industry and all the industries, obviously, that allow your, your connections and your availability to knowledge, because like there's so many people on these platforms that I wouldn't be able to connect with before um, that will make my company better. I can understand what 
customers all over the world are looking for through these platforms? What is the right way to go about selling to these companies because there's criteria that they post just right on the platform, things like that. So there's, there's a lot of cool technologies that are making my job, I wouldn't say easier, but definitely helping me find different people to talk to and, and guide me in the right direction. Sure. But one other thing I'm going to say that follows on to this, um, I know you operate in Canada. I know Canada has their own, what I call stringent food safety regulations, yes. for sure, that you already have to comply with up there. In the U.S., we have, of course, different regulations. Usually, mm -hmm. most of those come from the FDA. Yes, um, you did hit something earlier that does matter in the U.S. It's, I hate to say it's not a big deal. It's always a big deal to be able to do, as you said earlier, to be able to trace the source of your food, you know, from end to end, as you pointed out earlier. Why mm -hmm. that's important is in the case of, like, recalls. So in the U.S., we've had, in the past, we've had recalls that, quote, didn't go well. What that, like, mm -hmm. the better best one was probably five years ago. I think we had romaine lettuce go off the shelves in the U.S. because they couldn't figure out where the bad romaine came from. So the simple sure. answer was take yeah. off all romaine. And it's like, what? Mm -hmm. So now it turned out, I think there were two farms that had, I'll call it um, bad lettuce, if you will, but all romaine <laughs> disappeared. So it hurt not just the rest of the farmers, it hurt everybody in, in the, uh, the whole food supply chain. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. And so, and I can't remember if it was three months or whatever it was, it was a long time before we could get romaine back into the supply chain, uh, which hurt everybody. And mm -hmm. the thing about that blockchain technology is it is designed for that track and trace recall stuff to say, if we have everybody networked, we can then identify easily and pinpoint faster recalls uh, and so on, uh, and traceability mm -hmm. forward and backward, um, which is a big deal. So it does pay off there. In the US, in 2024, we have a new Food Safety Act that comes into play that is mm -hmm. going to require that level of traceability in the U.S. So as yeah. you open up here, you know, it's not next year, but it would be 2024 that all mm -hmm. of those regulations around traceability and recall would impact you at that point for sure. But you have two years to get ready for it, so mm -hmm. it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, and I agree. It's super important. Like even as I was doing some research on um blockchain and in, in, in food supply chain. And I mean, the minimal knowledge that I have about it, but sort of what I what I gathered is that everything can be done basically inst instantaneously, which is, which is huge. And that's what tech does, right? It takes data and it allows you to analyze it very quickly and to allow you to make quick decisions. So a quick decision that you need to recall something, but not just a quick decision, but like making sure that you're pinpointing like what you were saying, the actual origin of where that came from very quickly. Also forecasting, like that's huge too. Um, knowing yeah. where your business can go or what can go wrong based on maybe past data, either from your own company or other companies. I mean, it's definitely something I'm incredibly interested in and I, I wouldn't want to not implement that in my company at one point because why wouldn't I? Like, it just sounds like it's really the, only logical way to run your company like technology yeah. is good <laughs> data is good it helps you become the best version of not only who you're trying to go after but like what you're trying to make it's just everything should be streamlined that way yeah you know you're right because there's two sides to that story one side is i want to build a community of in a sense people who have i'll call it shared values and a similar consciousness and i can do that with communications and the mm -hmm. blockchain can provide support for that. But separately, you hit the other point, which is I need operational excellence across that whole food supply chain that I, I, in a sense, am part of. And that's the other thing. You're right. The speed of getting that information there automatically shared uh, is mm -hmm. very different. I'm a guy that's a million years old. And I've been in IT before I think computers existed. And so the deal mm -hmm. is we did it the old way, where we had to write custom code to move data from point A to point B. And mm -hmm. so if either I didn't get the job done or I got it done and I needed to make a change, it was always a slow thing. And with blockchain, mm -hmm. it's a lot, to your point, the data is distributed more accurately and quickly generally than you can do in these older uh, methods that I used to use for sure. Mm -hmm. So there are advantages to that for sure. Um, yeah, so I wanna thank you, Mel, this has been awesome. So eatnoco.com, uh, uh, everybody should go out there, check it out, see the website. Uh, check our calendar to see where the events are going to show up next. Uh, even if you have to drive to Toronto to get to those events, it's mm -hmm. probably worth checking it out. Um, Not in so the very thank you for winter. <laughs> the... <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on Future Foodcast. This has been awesome. It's so nice. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcast. 
Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry. 